Welcome to Business Law and More, the podcast that's all about the journey, not just the destination. My name is Rena. I'm a lawyer, business owner, and managing partner of Cosbond. This podcast is for creative entrepreneurs where we discuss business insights, legal hurdles, and more to help you build a business and life that you love. Thanks for spending time with me today. Turn up the volume and let's begin. Today, I'm joined by Charlotte Harsant, who is a trainee solicitor at Correspond Solicitors. She's a first year trainee doing extremely well, and she's going to be providing some insights into her experience with Correspond Solicitors, but also what it is like to get a training contract, what's involved in training contract applications, how to apply, and a lot more. So welcome to the podcast, Charlotte. Thank you for having me, Rena. Oh, excellent. So let's crack on with this then. Charlotte, you're a first year trainee solicitor. Let's start off with what is a training contract? So the SRA defines training contracts as a two-year recognised period of training in which you undertake two years and perhaps a number of seats. So that usually is six-month periods, four of them obviously, in different practice areas of law. And at the end of this, you decide which area you'd like to qualify into and you qualify as a solicitor. So traditionally, the route was that once you get a training contract, there's almost three or four different seats, if you like, different areas that once you found one that you do some experience in, and then you move on to the next and you move on to the next. Is that usually what it's like or has that sort of changed now? That is the traditional route. And I know that a lot of law firms still maintain the four seats, um, perhaps one would be in a secondment as well to a, a business, a client or abroad. However, a lot of law firms now have transitioned more to multiple practice areas at once. It gives the trainees the ability to work on different matters for a prolonged period of time, often seeing them from start to finish, which you wouldn't necessarily get if you were just doing six month seats. That's how it's a lot of law firms are now adopting that approach. Okay, that's interesting. So it's quite flexible as to how it was before, which, which was really rigid. And did you have much of a choice in which seats you can do traditionally, or was it just what was available or the type of firm? I believe it. a lot of law firms you can put in for what seats, what practice areas you would prefer to sit. Whether you are given those is a different story because it's always going to be based on the commercial needs of that law firm. So if, for example, litigation is really busy at the moment, they'll obviously want to take some trainees in that as opposed to perhaps like a private client or a different practice area may be transactional. It might not be as busy. So it makes sense for the business to, or for the law firm to put their trainees in the place where there is work. And it usually used to be, or it used to be that your last seat is the one that you qualify in. So traditionally then, or strategically, the trainees would have their last seat to be the one that they really just want to qualify in. I suppose that's all changed as well. From the top of my head, I believe that is the kind of how a lot of trainees would like to do it and how a law firm would like to do it that way, just because it then integrates that trainee into their newly qualified position. They know the team, they know the work, and they can seamlessly transition into that qualified role. However, I think now it's difficult because a lot of trainees don't actually as well know what they want to qualify into. They have the idea that's the area that they want to qualify into when they start actually doing the work it is. So sometimes I think it can actually turn everything on its head. And as I said, it depends on what the business, what the law firm has available, what the workload, where it is and where they can place the trainee or the, as the newly qualified solicitor. It's all around sort of the business need those as well. Um, so whether it's going to be a traditional three or four seat rotation or whether it's going to be right, this is the work that you've got on and keep record of the experience that you're getting. And then at the end depends on where the business need is for you to then qualify in. And if there is a role, that's great. And sometimes there isn't a role. It's not actually guaranteed, is it? Yeah, definitely. I think it's very important that prospective trainee or current trainees keep an eye on websites like Legal Cheek. They post the retention rates of different law firms, trainee solicitors, and whether they've achieved a newly qualified role. I think I've just seen that Slaughter and May have retained 100% of their trainees, which is an incredible figure. So there was obviously room in the law firm, in the business side, for that number of trainees. However, 
other law firms publish theirs and it's closer to maybe 70 80 percent because you've got to remember that some trainees they may actually want to move on at the end of the training contract the law firm might not be the fit for them but equally on the business side of the law firm there might not be the role there you did the lpc and not the sqe and the lpc is either one year full-time or two years part-time course and it's more of a legal practice course So what's the SQE and how do they both differ? So why did you decide the LPC as opposed to the SQE route? Initially, I was the guinea pig year. Going down the route that isn't tried and tested was of slight apprehension to me. I didn't know whether that was something that people, the law firms, um, were going to prescribe to. So that's why I kept with the LPC. Um, Also because I kind of knew that there was textbooks already out there. There's a lot of information online that will help you through it. Whereas the SQE, I would have been going in completely blind. The SQE differs from the LPC because it's meant to be more more inclusive way of getting people into the legal sphere. It is two exams, so the SQE1 and the SQE2. Um, again, I think across a year or an academic year, as the LPC is. However, you can qualify under the SQE by undertaking qualifying work experience. And that can be anything from working at citizens advice, being a paralegal, or doing something a bit more traditional trainee role that a lot of law firms have now implemented. And it just needs to be signed off by a solicitor or by the law firm. It's the two very different routes, isn't it? One is when you are sitting behind a desk still and learning and the other one's very hands-on as well. And I suppose, is that because training contracts are like gold dust to find and maybe the Law Society thought of a possible new entry route for what future lawyers to get into? Definitely. I think a lot of people know that law is exclusive. It's hard to find your place within the legal sphere because it's traditionally a closed off profession. So the SQE has definitely been introduced to try and combat that and make it easier for people to enter the legal world. I believe it's supposed to be cheaper. The training contracts that are on offer currently, I think is something about 5,000 across the UK, across England and Wales. You'd have to double check. You think about the number of people who go to university, do a law degree, and then add on top of that people like me, who did a non-law degree and then converted to law. And then add on top of that, you've got all the international students. When you add all that together, all of them competing for those 5,000 training contracts, it is literally gold dust. Yeah, Yeah. imagine And the cost of it as well, because the LPC is not cheap as well. Whereas the SQE is because you're working at the same time and earning as well. So if you've got that student loan, you can start paying it off sooner rather than waiting to rack up more costs with the LPC as well. But it swings and roundabouts. So how would one go about looking for a training contract then? And tell us about your experience. Okay, so the traditional way of looking for a training contract is looking at the law firms or the practice areas that you are interested in and then maybe taking that on to specific law firms, having a look at their ideals, their kind of ethos and seeing if that's a fit for you. You then wait to see whether their training contract applications are open, which I believe are around the autumn time up until January. You make a very standard application. I don't think it's a CV anymore. I think they're prerequisite applications that have a number of questions in about your academic history and your work experience. And then there are some key questions that get you thinking and you have to you know, put your answers to them like commercial questions. Uh, you then are invited to an assessment centre where you may meet other people who have applied. You have to work in teams, the individual exercises, and then a final interview with probably a partner and the graduate recruitment section of that law firm. So that's the very standard way. Alternatively, the route that I undertook was by getting a paralegal job, first of all, and then gaining that experience and then being within the world of law and then from then on getting recognised and invited to apply for a training contract. And that's how I end up at Carter Bond. Yeah, and there are many different routes and every firm is very different with their process 
Some is about sending a CV initially, some is online forms, some of them is away days or you know, going to the office and doing presentations and etc. psychometric tests. So it varies, but I think the key is to see when the opening is. And as you said, actually, you touched on a really good point here, is to see which firm takes your interest, depending on what area of law. There's no point applying to a family law firm if your interest is very commercial and corporate and property and so on, because you're not going to get that experience there. So it's not just a tick box exercise. It's the, the firm has also got to be the right firm for you as well. Otherwise, you're not going to enjoy your training. You're not going to get the right qualifications or the experience, and you're going to walk away from it thinking, is this really for you? Definitely. And law firms know mm. when you're not interested because you're not showing that interest and you're not tailoring mm. your applications. And these graduate recruitment teams will know instantly when they can see that your application is generic. There's no real insight into them as a law firm and the practice area that you want to go into. And if you're going to get chat GPT to do your CV, check it, double check it. There's no Americanized words in there. We're talking about UK law because there's no such thing and, and so on as well. Definitely. I think that's a Probably a big, another area. We could do a whole other podcast on that. <laughs> I totally agree. So talk me through your average day. Tell me what you do during a day from when you start. So if you're giving an insight to somebody who's looking to go into law and wants to know what it's like actually working in the law firm, because sitting behind a desk and learning textbook law or learning the LPC and filling out the TR1s is very different to actual practice. So give me an example of what you'd be doing in a day or in a few days. As mentioned at Carter Bond, the training contract is across multiple practice areas. So currently I focus on corporate, commercial, dispute resolution and a bit of property here and there and finance. It all comes under transactional umbrella aside from the dispute resolution. So in a kind of typical day, I could be working on anything from looking at a share purchase agreement and drafting ancillary documents to that, like board minutes, to ensure a transaction is correctly authorised by the directors. And then if there's a ordinary resolution that needs to be done by the shareholders on the kind of dispute resolution side. So it's not always behind a desk and you should really put yourself out there because these opportunities arise and even if I'm perhaps not of the mind that I'd rather qualify into corporate rather than dispute resolution, I think it's important to grab every opportunity that comes your way because I may find that I'll go to the trial and it's really interesting to me and that's something I do actually want to pursue. In terms of the property side, drafting leases and looking at property searches um, and drafting reports on titles. So there is a massive mix. And I suppose that keeps you on your toes because you don't know what you're going to have on your desk to do. And you have to adapt. Yeah. Every lawyer you come across will talk about adaptability and working across multiple practice areas definitely encourages that because dispute resolution litigation can be very, I wouldn't say argumentative, but it's definitely more litigious is in the name and um, corporate is about being commercial and working to reach an agreement with the other side so you have to put different hats on for different seats okay and tell me what's your favorite i do actually think the whole firm knows corporate but i know that the litigation team would like to steal me so um, i've previously attended court for a, a hearing but this is a full one day trial so i'm really excited to go and you know, see the barrister in action as well well, good luck and feedback as well and tell us what your experience is and if you've actually converted and gone to the other side. In the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> the dark side. So if you were going to give any tips for somebody joining the profession and who's looking for a training contract, what tips would you give them? And there's a whole list that you could probably come out with, but say your top three or top five. Okay, so probably number one is to focus on yourself. It's very important that you, know, you envisage just yourself and how you're going to get into law and without taking on board what other people are doing. And I remember being at university and doing my law conversion and hearing some of my friends saying my dad's a barrister or my mum's a public lawyer. And it can be very easy to get you down because you don't have that in necessarily. As soon as you stop thinking like that and realising that you can forge your own path, you'll find that you actually progress a lot quicker because 
it's solely about you and the steps that you take. And yes, perhaps we have to work a little bit harder in that respect because you don't have that immediate in, but ultimately that just adds to your character. 100%, 100%. I agree. And a lot of people say, is it all about who you know and not what you know? And yes, there is some merit in that, but long term, I think I totally agree with you, Charlotte, that just because you don't have anybody that you could call upon to get you that in into the legal profession doesn't mean that you can't do it yourself. And both of us are living proof of that. And my second point would be to always put your best foot forward. If you do happen to get a paralegal role or some kind of work experience, be aware that anybody and everybody are watching. And yeah, you may not think they may seem completely uninterested in you, but I'm promising you that there'll be people taking notice of what you do. And ultimately, that's what led me to end up with a training contract at Carter Bond. So always putting your best foot forward is paramount. It can lead to opportunities that you don't even realise are there. Absolutely. It's, it's all a stage, isn't it, actually, when, when you think about it like that? Brilliant. Great advice. I watch your third tip. My third tip would be, it's a cliche. You probably hear it on every legal podcast, but don't give up. I'll caveat that by saying in law, law is inherently about determination and drive in everything that I see. I see in Carter Bond itself, I see people having to back their client's corner, disagree with the other side, work to reach some kind of agreed point. If a solicitor just gave up, the client wouldn't get what they want. So I always think if you are willing to give up at the first hurdle, yeah, you, know, you think, well, I've applied to two training contracts and both of them have rejected me or this isn't for me, then perhaps law isn't actually for you because law is about determination, drive and resilience. And applying for training contracts and receiving rejections all just add to that and should just add to your drive to qualify ultimately. Really great points there, Charlotte. Thank you so much for all of that and for your insights. And I'm sure people listening to this who are thinking about going into the profession, who don't understand maybe what it's like to have a training contract and what's involved, I hope that they find this useful. And I hope that you'll join us again on another podcast. 100%. I'm ready to be invited back. (laughs) (laughs) Brilliant. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Business Law and More, a Cosbond podcast. Before we go, if you enjoy the podcast, please follow and subscribe to the show, share the podcast or tell a friend about it, leave us a review and stay tuned for more next week.